Well, what a treat to be here. This is fabulous. Um, and what a great way to start hearing about dairy farms. Because the image that popped into my head is my childhood memory of visiting my aunt and uncle and cousins in Littleton, Colorado, and going down the road to the dairy farm where we watched the cows be milked. And the best part of all was they served ice cream. Yeah. And so, uh, I'm not sure what drew us with all the cows and the interesting process of the dairy farm or the ice cream, but whichever it was, it was a, it's a memory that stands out for me. And I'm curious about you all. How many of you are native uh, to Colorado? Come here, native. Ooh, quite, a, quite a few folks. How many came from east of Colorado? Oh, my great friend. <laughs> How many came from west? Oh, that's a fair, fair looking number. All right, so clearly this is the garden spot, the Eden, of where you want to move to. <laughs> well, I grew up uh, in Southern California, Long Beach, Jane, California. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks for feeling all. Thanks. Uh, and I grew up in Southern California, and every year we would drive to visit relatives here in Denver. And one of my early childhood memories was not writing a letter to the editor for, to get the page back, but was helping my grandfather, who uh, published the Aurora Democrat and the Adams County News, two weekly newspapers based in Aurora. And my four-year-old memory is helping grandpa assemble whatever he called the legals around the dining room table. And I have this memory of the dining room table just at eye level. And me helping, and the best part of it all, was that I could help and my younger sister couldn't because she couldn't reach the top of the dining room table. So I thought I was terribly grown up. But what I learned in that process from my grandfather was that there were important things that could happen that could affect people's lives, make life better, or make life worse for the whole community. And he taught us at a very early age that politics was about people. And it was about having conversations with each other about the best way forward. Now, what this did for me was to say that politics becomes an important piece of how we live together. Now, our challenge is, however, that that concept of politics as being about people has gotten pretty undermined. The consequences are um, the individualism that we're facing right now in our society is pulling us apart so that we're not having these conversations together. And what I want to take a little time to talk about this morning is what is our current situation? What do we do? How do we deal with it? And, uh, you know, I'm a Catholic sister, so I do this for faith, but Pope Francis, who I think appeals to a wide variety of folks, uh, what I've discovered is, is Catholics are often less enthusiastic about Pope Francis than non-Catholics. And what I've come to realize is Catholics are a little nervous, is it going to last? And non-Catholics are, oh wow, this is just great, enjoy, enjoy. So I'm trying to take the non-Catholic perspective and just enjoy. But last November, <laughs> he issued this uh, called uh, an exhortation. It was kind of like him speaking from his heart to the world. And he said in paragraph 33, oh, and I just have to say, usually documents from popes are not real. They are a pure <laughs> insomnia. But this one is so accessible, so exciting. I, I, mean, I have it all marked up and, uh, and read through it a bunch of times. Because he talks from his heart about a global perspective that we need to be concerned about. But here, paragraph 53, he says, Just as the commandment, thou shalt not kill, sets a clear limit in order to safeguard the value of human life, Today we also have to say, thou shalt not, to an economy of exclusion and inequality. Such an economy kills. How can it be that it is not new, a news item when an elderly homeless person dies of exposure, but it is news when the stock market loses two points? 
this is a case of exclusion. Can we continue to stand by when food is thrown away while people are starving? This is a case of inequality. Today, everything comes under the laws of competition and survival of the fittest, where the powerful feed upon the powerless. As a consequence, masses of people find themselves excluded and marginalized, without work, without food, without possibilities, without any means of escape. This challenge that he sets up, I think, really sets in context the political reality that we're working with. And some of you do know that on the bus, on our first bus trip in 2012, we went out on the bus uh, to oppose Paul Ryan's budget. But <laughs> But what you have to know is that the reason we were able to do it and to get some media attention is because of the Vatican. So you know the Vatican? How did that happen? Well, what happened was in April 14th of 2012, our little organization uh, celebrated 40 years. We've worked on Capitol Hill for 40 years, and the question was, how do we get our message out there? How do we let people know what we're doing? And sometimes you may feel like that. How do we let rest, the rest of Colorado know how we're striving to create a hunger-free Colorado? Well, you have to be really careful what you're praying for, because we had little ideas. We're going to take out a Google ad, because we couldn't afford a, a print ad, and we were going to I don't know, you know, ask a member to get another member. And we were going to try to make something happen. But four days later, the Vatican answered our prayer. When they named our little organization with nine full-time staff as being a better influence of Catholic Sisters in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and that we focused entirely too much on the needs of people in poverty. <laughs> and not enough on the issues they thought that were important. Well, I have to say, I don't regret doing what we've been doing. In fact, I sort of took it as a badge of honor. That probably wasn't what they intended. But to be criticized for working too much with people who live on the economic margins of our society, wow, that's pretty good. That's like a seal of approval in my book. <laughs> so, but the question became, because we had a lot of notoriety, a lot of immediate attention, how do we use this moment for moment for mission? What can we do? And on May 14th, we held a meeting at our office at Network. And we had about 35 people there, our late colleagues. And by no one knows who first said road trip. But by the end of the meeting, we were going on the road. I had a map in my head. <laughs> I knew where Catholic Sisters and other houses were, where we could get a free night to stay. That was part of it. <laughs> but the other part of it was we knew where key districts were and where we could go to push back against the Paul Ryan budget. Because that budget was undermining most of the services that Catholic Sisters provide. And that sustained our community. Now, after that bus trip, which was pretty magical, what I just what I had this chance uh, after our meeting in Janesville, where Paul Ryan is from, we met with staff and I asked, could I please meet with the congressman? Because we hadn't been able to get any meeting with the congressman. So um, in July, after our bus trip, I got to meet with him for the first time. And since then I've met with him a couple of times and I got to testify in front of him. Well, it's really interesting. Because Congressman Ryan believes that the way forward is just letting business be business. He believes that if we give business a free reign, it'll all be okay. He says he does not believe in a minimum wage. He says he doesn't believe in these programs that are sapping, as he calls it, sapping the life out of our economy because of government spending. He doesn't believe in SNAP and all of these amazing programs that have made the difference. He thinks that the dairy industry alone could take care of the hunger. He thinks all of the churches could take care of those who hunger. But what 
Bread for the World figured out was the cuts he proposed were so great, so huge in the food programs, in the eating programs, that every church, synagogue, mosque, house of worship would have to raise an additional $50,000 every year for 10 years in order to make up the difference. Now, I don't know about if you have a house of worship, but I know mine could not afford that. It is not realistic. The problem of hunger is so large in our society right now. It's a societal issue. And the reason that SNAP, Supplemental uh, the Nutrition and Assistance Program, all of a sudden I can lock what is it? But food scams, this is the shorthand for food scams. What SNAP did was grow in the recession. And he's horrified that government had to spend more money. He totally loses sight of the fact that it was because we had more hungry people. And in our society, the thing that we do believe is that all of our people should eat. Now, a glimmer of good news was I got to testify on the Senate side in front of the Senate Health Committee on minimum wage. And Congressman, I mean, Senator Lamar Alexander from Tennessee spent his entire time not asking questions, but rather going after me for saying that maybe business had the responsibility of paying just wages as well as making sure that we have a safety net program to take care of our people. And you know what he said? He said he didn't think business had any part in this hunger problem. Rather, he said that it was up to government to make sure their people could eat it. <laughs> we get two people, Congressman Ryan, who's saying the only way forward is business, just let business do it, business will take care of it, business has a heart, business will do it. And then we get another senator saying, oh, business shouldn't have anything to do with this. Here's the problem. Here's the problem, is that we want to leave people out no matter what we do. And the fact is, this issue is so key for our future. All of our issues are so key that what we are called to is the 100%. We, the people, need to make sure everyone is included. Because Paul Ryan's analysis is that, well, you know, well, we can't afford the SNAP program. We just can't afford it. And so because we can't afford it, well, then we have to cut it. That's just it. But you know what he's doing? At the same time, they are about to vote on making permanent tax extenders for uh, business corporations that are going to cost billions of dollars. They're going to make them permanent, and they're not going to have what they call offset. Well, it's for business. So we'll give anything to business. After talking to him, what I've realized is he knows the needs of his friends. But the question becomes, who are his friends? Who does he know? How do we who know a different reality introduce him to our people? Our people who need help. It's really simple. But he does not know. He does not know the reality of the folks we know. And that's why I was so glad, Kathy, to hear the programs that you're working on so that the people who struggle use their voice. Because if Congress, if the Senate can hear the real stories, it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. Let me tell you a few stories. Um, uh, this summer, I had the honor of being in Chautauqua, New York. Any New Yorkers right here? People know Chautauqua? It is this amazing enclave of intellectual pursuit and money. And I'm talking about the income and wealth disparity. And uh, so one of the, the questions after I do this income and wealth disparity thing is, well, why don't the poor just go get organized? I don't understand that. <laughs> and I started talking about how much work it is if you work for minimum wage. And if you have two jobs, and you have to, uh, you know, you have to take public transit, and you often there's a long walk before or after your job, and then it's taking care of the kids, and it's doing all this. That time is such 
a stressor. And then if you're in any of these programs, even if you're working, then you gotta check in with your SNAP program. You have to go to the food bank. You have to try shopping. You have to do this, you have to do that. There is no time. So I, I made a pretty passionate argument, I thought, for it. And then the woman who works in the bookstore came up to me, named Ann. And Ann told me she was so grateful that I had answered the question that way. Because she thought her work was totally unseen. She works for minimum wage at the bookstore in Chicago. She uh, has four kids. She and her husband both have master's degrees, but they lost their jobs in the recession. They live in a rural place in New York. When they lost their jobs, they ended up losing their house. They live in a rented place. And she said, no one knows how much time it takes to bring their board. She can't afford to run the dryer, so the kids hang out the clothes either in the wintertime all over their house or out on the line. They don't have enough food, so they're using food, uh, the SNAP program. The kids are working on farms this summer to try to bring some extra food home. They don't, they always think, kid, do we really have to use the car? And they live out in the outskirts. She told me that it's about a four mile walk to the grocery store. Sometimes they just walk because they can't afford the gas. That's the reality. Ann works hard, has all of the credentials that one would think would say she would never be in that situation, but she is. Do you know the majority of us in the United States spend some time in our lives on in poverty, struggling? And I think one of the things, one of the judgments that happens that I've experienced is that people are afraid of that. And because they're afraid, then they're judging. Because as long as I can say you're lazy and therefore you're poor, I work hard so it won't happen to me. I can feel in control of my life. But what we have to do, we who know better, have to bridge that fear so that we can break open the reality among us is that things happen, tough things happen. And we need to care for the 100%. All are welcome at our table. All can be able to eat. Let me tell you about Robin. I love Robin. I, I've only met her once, but she was like this magical person. She had a smile and an enthusiasm that, you know, just was one of those people that just bubbles. And we were at the White House for the signing of the executive order uh, to raise the minimum wage for federal contract workers. And Robin was so excited to be in the White House. It was so great. And this 25-year-old young woman was just so enthused. She'd grown up in Virginia and had walked past on school trips, walked past the White House. But now she was in the White House. <laughs> and it was so dear. She, you have to sit and wait for the president for a very long time. So she's taking a picture of her chair. And then she has me take a picture of her sitting there. And then, you know, we got talking. And we're in the second row. So she's taking a picture of where the president's going to be and where what's going to happen. Well, what she said was, after we talked for a while, I commented on her gorgeous sapphire blue dress. It was just beautiful. And she said, I said, yes, it looks lovely on you. And she said, I got it from my store. I work in a national chain. I, I work for minimum wage. I mean, that's why I'm here, because my friend, Colleen's going to get a raise because of this order. I'm not. But, but if Colleen gets a raise, I think eventually I will, too. So I'm celebrating for Colleen. That's why we're here. And uh, so she works in this Colleen store chain for minimum wage. And she said she got her dress with her employee discount, and it was on sale. So she paid $20.43 for it. It's great. And then she talked about how what a lifeline the SNAP program had been for her and for her family because she'd been able to eat when she had nothing. But then she said to me, you know, by looking at me, you never know. I have to live in a homeless shelter because I can't afford rent in this area. I work full time, but I can't afford rent. And it made me realize, oh my glory, oh my glory, what is this economy of exclusion doing that our people who are working hard can't live where they want? What are we doing to fight?
folks who struggle so hard. And praise God we've got a safety net. Praise God we've got food pantries. But where's the justice? Where is the justice for folks who work hard? How do we do this? And then let me tell you about Jason, because Jason is like the other side of this. Jason is this 35-year-old I had met at a fundraiser for our organization for network. And this 35-year-old had built three different businesses. He was like this entrepreneur. And he said, you know, I, I, I'm not the smartest guy, I, but I got a head for business. And he apparently is quite wealthy, according to everybody in the room. And he was about to be a dad for the first time. So while he wanted to talk way more about being a dad, I tried to get him to talk about business. So, I mean, you know, paternity, that's nice. But like, hey, you talk to me about it. <laughs> what I'm interested in, you know, it is all about me. But um, <laughs> what I, what, he said was that he pays a living wage to all of his workers in the San Diego area. It's a high cost area, but he pays even the lowest skilled workers a living wage because he realizes that it's an investment in his business. And it's good for the people. He gives benefits to all of his workers. Um, he makes sure that they have a good work environment. He experiences better employee loyalty and uh, better productivity, and he thought it was a great thing. But he told me he was beginning to get miffed. He used the word miffed. I thought, oh, well, that's probably better than angry and said all this miffed. Okay. <laughs> so what did he mean by that? And he said that he was getting miffed because he realized his tax dollars were going to fund his competitors. I go, what? Your tax dollars are funding your competitors. How's that? And he said that what was disturbing him was that his competitors were paying these really low minimum wage and that those employees were having to go use the safety net to survive. And the safety net, things like SNAP, things like Medicaid, uh, housing vouchers, those kinds of things are funded with tax dollars. And Jason realized that his tax dollars were going to fund the safety net that were benefiting his competitors. So his competitors could pay lower wages and bid lower prices for the contracts that they could be. And I thought, whoa, I had never thought of that. I had never seen that intersection of some doing the right thing and the pressure on them to do something. Where did we as a nation lose that agreement that if you work full time, you should be able to live in it? Where did we lose the agreement that business should pay their full share of business costs? Isn't that what free market's about? Where did we lose the agreement that employers have a responsibility to employees just as employees have a responsibility to employers. Somewhere we've gone off the rails. And I've been thinking and praying about this for a long time, trying to figure out what happened. And I have a hunch that one of the things that happened is fear, fear. Remember after September 11th, 2001, that horrible day, and how everybody was frightened? I don't think we've recovered from that. That fear is driving us further and further apart. That fear is making us afraid to talk to each other. And what has happened is we've gotten polarized. Now, Kathy very kindly said that Congress was, how did you describe it, uh, clipping along at a glacial speed. <laughs> um, at least you gave them clipping along. I'm not sure I would do that. But the challenge is this. It's the polarization. I'm afraid to talk to you, and you're afraid to talk to me, because we might not agree, and then we don't know what to do. Here's the challenge. It's, if you're for hunger free Colorado, it's not just about food. It's about the hunger for community, the hunger to be connected, the hunger to move beyond the fear. We're about creating community, one person at a time. But we have got to break out beyond this fear because this fear is killing us. Literally, literally. Think of Ferguson. 
Think of the other places where it's gun violence is rampant. It's fear that is driving this. And we the people have got to move out beyond it. We've got to recover the public agreement that we're in this together. And it's true, we are. But some people prefer control and keeping us separate. So what I'm urging folks to do is to become what I call grocery store missionaries. You know, we never talk to each other. We only listen to the news I agree with. I do this too. I listen to Fox News for five minutes and I get a rash. <laughs> <laughs>